Hi guys and welcome back to the Carla Garrick Show. I believe it's episode 13 and maybe that is the curse that happened. So I'm not gonna lie, I'm a little frustrated because uh, as you know, I am trying to iterate, uh, change things, do new things. And so I'm working on building this home studio here on the west side of Manchester in the free state of New Hampshire. And I downloaded new software this morning, StreamYard, I did tests, I did everything, and I recorded an episode which uh, did not come out in any kind of high definition or at, it came out, you could hear me, but I was all fuzzy, fuzzy, fuzzy. So here we are doing it again. Um, and because my episodes are loosey, goosey, unscripted, Hopefully, uh, I'll be able to bring the passion and the energy again. So uh, I'm gonna go with it's unlucky 13 and uh, just move on from there. So this week, uh, in this episode, I'm gonna be talking about primarily three things. First of all, was Bob Saget murdered? Second of all, free speech is dead, long live big bro, and what's up with Canada? So um, before we start with those issues and have a conversation about that, I just wanted to recap what I've been up to over the past week. On Sunday, we had a delightful meetup of ladies for Valentine's Day. We did a Galentine's Day meetup uh, at one of our community centers here in the great uh, free state. And uh, it was wonderful. We had about 30 ladies, a whole bunch of little kiddos, because it's always great to see the free range children. We did a brunch. I believe Galentine started or is from Parks and Rec, and it's sort of a tongue in cheek, hey, you know, let's have the girls have some fun to uh, alternative to Valentine's Day. So I was really excited to do that, and it was great, and I hope we'll repeat it again in the future. At the same time, uh, one of our newer movers actually organized a porcupine outdoor event, which was snowshoeing, and uh, apparently that had a really great turnout too. So the community is growing, thriving, and as new movers come in, they're finding their passions and they are starting to contribute to our wonderful community. And I'm always excited to be able to share our community with the folks that watch this show. Uh, yesterday, actually, I went up to the State House. Those of you who follow along know I'm a big proponent of school choice. And the Democrats sadly introduced a bill to try and reverse all the school choice gains we've made here in New Hampshire. Last year, we passed the Education Freedom Accounts, which is basically an education saving account, which provides an opportunity of an X amount, I think it's about $5,000, that goes to the parents of children who are uh, of school age that they can then spend on any kind of schooling they want. This does include religious schools, but it also includes um, homeschooling programs. People use it for computers, for online classes, for robotics, for all kinds of things. Whatever the needs of the children are is something that is met with these. Um, the state representative, I believe it was Representative Ladau, I think is how you say his name, Ladau maybe, uh, who was the prime sponsor of the bill, uh, was, was, you know, I mean, a, a just, it felt a little dishonest the way he was positioning things. Uh, the starting point was he, he called these school vouchers. They are not vouchers. The money goes to the parents and that is from where it goes. So the argument that there is some kind of constitutional violation here just doesn't hold water because it is not, you know, taxpayers' money that's going directly to, uh, let's say, a Catholic school. It is simply the money is going back to the parents. It's actually their money. Um, and then those of us who are just subsidizing public schooling. Um, so so the money goes to them and then they can spend it as they see fit on their children's educational needs. Um, I think it's really disappointing, to be honest, that so many Democrats seem against choice. Uh, you know, they're certainly cho uh, for choice or used to be, I should say. 
for choice on so many other matters. Um, and what we want to do, I think, and where we all have common ground, is that we want to be providing the best education for children based on their learning needs. We know at this stage that one size does not fit all. And so, um, and so I really do hope that people will come around, realize that we're not, that the purpose of public education or educating children or taking money from taxpayers to spend on education should um, end up with children who are actually educated, who can read and write, and who aren't in failing schools or failing all the metrics that are set up. So, um, I, I, you know, I, I think I'm optimistic that we are still going to have education freedom accounts and school choice here in New Hampshire. Um, actually, I've, I'm, I'm fairly confident about that. Um, but it's always interesting to see, you know, how the other side bring something in and where their concerns lie. And uh, it just it just genuinely feels very disingenuous. A lot of the children who are testifying uh, are kids who are bullied in school, who are hurt, who might have IPEs, uh, so they have a special educational need and all of that. And I keep seeing, and quite frankly, it's propaganda from the left, um, from the progressives in the state who both use the language of vouchers, but then also say things like, I, I mean, I was horrified. I saw something that said that, um, you know, it's exclusionary and it absolutely is not. So uh, let's, let's keep the dialogue and the conversations honest and let's deal with the actual facts. Uh, so that was up at the State House yesterday. Uh, the other thing I wanted to just briefly talk about before we get to was Bob Saget murdered um, is I was saddened to learn yesterday that a author and satirist and humorist and New Hampshire author that I have always deeply admired, PJ O'Rourke passed away. Uh, he was fairly young. He was only 74. The, the report I saw said it was complications from lung cancer. And, uh, you know, I'm just deeply saddened. He was someone I, I admired. I had always hoped to become friends with him. Uh, I think he, he tended to treat us with a little bit of a long arm, which was a deeply missed opportunity as the greatest libertarian living writer until yesterday to have not really covered the Free State Project in any significant way. So um, my condolences go out to his family, to his wife, Tina, to everyone who knew him. Um, I'm, you know, his, his writing will live on, so there's always that, but um, rest in peace, PJ O'Rourke. All right, lots of death in this one, I'm afraid to say. So question, was Bob Saget murdered? Um, I'm going to go with a resounding no, but that is the conspiracy theory du jour on the interwebs today. Um, the autopsy report came out for, uh, for him and it appears that he had blood force trauma at the, um, at the back of his head. And uh, that is what the autopsy is saying killed him. It also says that he died with COVID. Now, based on what I read online, uh, he, was, he was a proponent of vaccines. He uh, had recently had his booster. And I think we should be asking more questions about these kinds of scenarios. Because of the uh, internet meltdown this morning, where I was actually cutting clips into the videos. So look at me go. But um, because that's not gonna be the case this time, we're just doing it straight up with a video camera. Um, maybe for next week, if we figure out all these hiccups, uh, I can show this. But if you can't wait till then, I recommend going to Odyssey, which is a sensor proof platform, something that we all need now, because unfortunately the big tech companies have kind of turned evil, which feels like a deep betrayal to me because, you know, tech was sort of my background. Um, I worked for a high tech companies in Silicon Valley for a long time as a lawyer. And so I'm kind of just deeply, deeply annoyed with, uh, with all the censorship. But if you go to Odyssey, you can actually see a clip from, uh, I believe her name is Heather McDonald maybe, but anyway, she's a comedian who, uh, who uh, was uh, doing a bit on stage and uh, was actually poking fun at people who are um, not as eager to take the experimental gene therapies as uh, some of the people are, which, you know, 
again, should be your choice. If you're into it, do it. If you're not into it, you shouldn't have to do it. Mandating anything where there is risk, there has to be choice. Um, so in any event, she uh, she was on stage she's making a joke and she's like, yeah, I've had my boosters, I had a shingle shot, I had all this stuff. And then she just literally passes out. No one in the audience knows what's going on. Initially, everyone's laughing and then they're like, oh crap, no, this lady is actually in distress. Uh, turns out she has concussion as well as a skull fracture. Now, I can tell you, I have seen people pass out over the years. Sadly, my mother um, actually fell once in, in South Africa before they immigrated. And she always used to say, you know, she, she said, I don't know why they say Victorian ladies swoon. She's like, because that's not what happens. Like if you pass out, depending on if you're going forward or back, if you've really passed out, you hit yourself really, really hard. In my mother's case, she fell forward and actually broke her nose, knocked out her teeth. I mean, it was, it was bad. She had to have plastic surgery. Um, it was not great. But what I wonder is in the case of Bob Saget and where does the was he murdered question come from is there is a sort of conspiracy theory that's bubbling up. Initially it started with was it the vaccine? But now people are saying because of the blunt force trauma was he murdered? I think the most likely scenario actually lies in the middle. I think he had an episode as a result of the booster, which we do know is having negative impacts on people, particularly people with com compromised immune systems. And, um, and I think he probably just passed out, hit his head really hard, which is what the autopsy report said, and then um, probably woke up or came to at some stage, thought, oh wow, that was like, what? I'm gonna crawl into bed and then passed away in his sleep. So that's, that's the story. Uh, we, you know, I'll keep an eye on it, but I'm pretty sure that's probably what happened. All right, free speech is dead. Long live big bro. Now for the one person who doesn't get that, that's sarcasm, let me explain. That's sarcasm. If you've been living under a rock, you uh, maybe may not know that we are turning into a biofascist, global, elite, suppressed society, um, and the hits just keep on coming. So uh, last week or earlier this week, February 7th, the DHS actually came out, so that's the Department of Homeland Security, came out with a new bulletin in which they warn us that fake news is feeling domestic extremism. So, uh, yeah, here's the thing with free speech. The minute you start policing people's speech, you're on a downward spiral of just hell because it's like who, who, vets this content, who decides? I mean, I've seen COVID warnings on my food posts at this stage. So it is, um, it is problematic that we've sort of gone down this big brother route. But the Department of Homeland Security, which you might recall was actually formed after 9-11, which was a giant intelligence failure and somehow they got rewarded with this big department. Um, but they are saying that the United States remains in a heightened threat environment fueled by several factors, including an online environment filled with false and misleading narratives and conspiracy theories and other forms of mis, dis, and mal information. I'll pause there for a moment. So they have handily called their mis, dis, and mal MDM. Now what does that sound like? Does that sound a little bit like another thing you've heard of? I don't know, maybe uh, weapons of mass destruction? See, that's how smart they are. There are a lot of people in the intelligence agencies working on how they can manipulate you. Uh, the media is doing it, Big Brother is doing the tech censorship, and the government is actually doing a lot of propaganda, which is what we saw every time they changed the definition of words to suit 
their their uh, their process. So we have these MDMs that have been introduced and or amplified by foreign and domestic threat actors. The bulletin states these threat actors seek to exacerbate societal friction to sow discord and undermine public trust in government institutions. All right, so. They're basically whining that they can't control the narrative. What is the narrative they're trying to control? That the government could somehow control a virus that spread across the world, that they magically made these really great vaccines that everyone should take. They're so awesome that they have to bribe you, cajole you, threaten you, and mandate you to take it. Um, so, Strangely, I don't feel like it's the people who are trying to get the message out to the public that they have options uh, with regard to this is the problem, but it is. So I know because I've been doing liberty activism for a really long time that we are, we, we have better ideas. Ideas are bulletproof as they say. I think I have a picture back here of that. Um, and so we know our ideas are winning in the sense that there is a human desire to live in peace, to live, you know, well with your neighbors, to, uh, to not have this constant division, to not have these <laughs> psychopaths and sociopaths who want to control every aspect of our lives. And so as our ideas have started to really pass into the mainstream, uh, they're getting nervous and the U.S. federal government is very corrupt. Uh, you know, no one is held accountable for anything. We have literally gone into several wars now that have not been legally constitutionally declared. I mean, right now we've got the whole Ukraine thing going on. And, um, and I think they're, they're nervous. I think they, they're worried. And so they keep upping the stakes. That being said, the DHS has been crying wolf for a really long time about domestic terrorism as well as domestic extremism. Um, you know, the, the thing that surprises me or that actually I find quite troubling is this constant move towards trying to paint everyone you don't agree with as an extremist. Remember the good old days where, I don't know, people were allowed to have differing opinions without it being like war, right? So as we have this like wave of information and this uh, mind control, really, um, they, are, they are, you know, concerned that people don't like the government, quite rightly, because they actually have harmed people. It has never, ever been about the pandemic. The, it's a virus, it's endemic, we could have handled it. The problems over the past two years and the reason why the Canadian truckers are hoot hoot mad is because the government's response to COVID was nonsense. What they are trying to do is to usher in a global surveillance state where we have the elites who can live without their masks and go to their fancy parties and have their things. And the rest of the people are expected to stay in their pods, to eat their insect gruel and to obey and comply. And that's where we're at. Now, what happened in Canada or what is happening in Canada? Canada had severe lockdowns. They have had a really hard time for the past two years. I know because my sister-in-law and brother-in-law live in on Vancouver Island um, and they say it was pretty gnarly. I mean, it was like you had to draw your curtains if you had friends over because maybe some Cassandra or some Karen was going to call the police on you. That's crazy. Again, if you have a different appetite for risk, that's fine. If you wanna wear a mask, wear a mask. If you wanna get jabbed, get jabbed. Where the dividing line and where the issue comes in is when people are saying we can force other people to do things against their will because it makes us feel safe. That 
is not allowed in a free society. So the Canadians are fed up. The Canadians are very polite people, so how did they go about their protests? They started this huge truck convoy that is headed to Ottawa, their capital city, and they were literally like, yep, we are going to be in the city until you lift the mandates, you lift the vaccine mandates, and you stop all this insane control mechanisms. Justin Trudeau, their PM, has gone like full and he, uh, I mean, he basically called them, these are peaceful protests. Do yourself a favor, go to YouTube, go to Odyssey. Odyssey is your uh, censor proof platform. And just take a look. These are literally like their hay bales or kids jumping around, everything. First they sent in the police and they took away their, uh, their gas canisters and things to actually keep them warm. It's cold in Canada this time of year. Then uh, they started calling them, uh, extremists. Uh, there's a lot of like right wing, right alt right extremist language. I mean that is sort of the catch-all phrase that they just throw at everyone they don't like anymore. It's almost nonsensical at this stage. And so they um, they had done a fundraiser online and um, Justin Trudeau just like instituted some emergency powers and was like we're gonna steal that money. They stole $9 million from people who voluntarily donated to a peaceful protest in a Western country because they think they own you. So um, the, the, the donor list was also leaked. Now, it was hacked and leaked. And that's kind of interesting because I'm pretty sure that's some statecraft going on too. I don't see why anyone would, uh, would, would dox that or leak that information if it wasn't some kind of government agency who then wanted to create more problems and more strife. So my Canadian brethren are, um, are holding the line. I, I think that's incredibly important. We are in a Im information warfare at this stage. Uh, you are being lied to by your government. There is a lot of really shady stuff that is going on and it behooves you to really start to prime your own curiosity to say to yourself, wait a second, wait a second. Again, ask yourself, was it the pandemic? Like, did you see dead people in the streets? Did you um, ever get the sense? Or was it these things they told us about something that was going on? And if you're honest with yourself, you know it's the things they told you. You know, it breaks my heart. The reason I didn't have an episode last week was my dad is very ill. He got sick after his second jab. There is no doubt in my mind that these things are related. He had a compromised immune system and rheumatoid arthritis and all of that. And I think the science is not there. This is an experimental gene therapy. It is not a vaccine regardless of what they're saying or how they're changing the definitions of things. And I will dedicate a whole show to this, I think, once I figure out the tech side of things where I can show you the different words and show you the, the, the different things. Um, but I guess in conclusion for this week, uh, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, what I'm reading. I'm currently reading Grit, the power and passion, the power of passion and perseverance. It's by Angela Duckworth, and it's a New York Times bestseller. Um, it really looks at the neuroscience of what makes people successful, what makes them uh, sort of stick it out, and all of that. And I think when we analyze sort of this return, I hope to this notion of self ownership, right? You, yes, we are part of a society and we are part of a community, but we are first and foremost individuals. The smallest minority is the individual. All groups are made up of individuals. And so you need, and I wanna encourage you to, figure out what your passion is and then persevere at it. So I made some notes 
um, where we where from the book and and maybe I'll do a, another episode on this as well but where she talks about what 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 leads to grit you know because gritty people succeed because if you don't give up like I didn't give up on this episode I really wanted to Louie and I were having quite the fight because I was super annoyed that I had to do it twice, but I didn't give up and I'm here and I want you to not give up either and I want you to live a fulfilled and happy life. And that means you need tools in order to do that. So where does grit come from? Grit really has four elements to it. It means you have to be interested in something, then you have to practice it, you have to have that purpose, and you must always, always have hope. And regardless of the fact that my uh, book is called The Ecstatic Pessimist, Stories of Hope, see, mostly. Um, and you can check that out on Amazon or on my website, carlagarrick.com. Uh, you know, the, the, the optimism, hope, uh, thinking about the future, really aspiring to things is one of those mechanisms that keeps you moving forward. And so um, I think part of the malaise in society is that people don't really know what they want as an individual because we're taught now in the schools that everything's this collective. I mean, I read this this wording that said there's a collective mental health crisis. Now, do I think people have had a rough time? <laughs> yes, yes, I do. But these are millions of individuals. It's not some kind of collective zeitgeist. And you can't fix problems by looking at it from the, there's a homeless problem. You've got to look at it like, why is that dude snorting meth and stealing shit from cars? So, grit. You've got to have interest, you got to practice, you got to have purpose, and you got to have hope. What is interest? So where do you foment and get this like, ooh, this is my thing, right? Um, she talks about three Ds. It's discovery, development, and deepening. So how do you discover what you're really interested in? Now, you can't make a career out of playing Minecraft, or very few people can, but you should be looking for those little moments in your life where something just sparks. You'll know it, you'll feel it when you, when, when you sense it. Um, maybe over the past, uh, next week or so, or the next month, really mindfully try and find those moments. Really try and focus and feel what excites you. Maybe it's like literally a hike with your dog and looking at nature and maybe that's a hobby. Maybe that's not a career. But really starting to isolate and identify what piques your interest. An example she uses in the book is Julia Child, who, you know, was not a cook, was not a chef, was not a foodie, that word didn't exist back then, until she went to Paris with her husband and they ate really, really good food. And she was like, this, this is what I want, right? So think about your this moment. And then let's see if we can actually start to cultivate and develop happier people by actually mindfully trying to attune yourself to yourself. There was this quote in the book as well where she said, um, the emotion of boredom is always self-conscious. And I thought that was so interesting. The emotion of boredom is always self-conscious because you know it when you feel it. Now, I'm a big nerd and I love to read, so I've literally never been, I shouldn't say never, but I've hardly ever been bored in my life. Um, and that's a choice. So I would like to, oh shit. Ah. Sorry. All right, so. <laughs> Because no show can be without a disaster, and I've already done this twice today, so here you go, third time's a charm, episode 13 of The Carla Garrick Show. Thank you for joining me. Hopefully things will be a little better next time. Keep tuning in. I promise by the end of the year, this will be at least 5% better than today. Thanks so much for joining me. Remember, together and individually, we can live free and thrive. Peace out, guys.